So hello everybody, I'm Francisco Medmarco, as Cindy said, postdoc in Hodes Lab at UCR. I'm from Spain and I've been working on biological control uh, since 2007, first in citrus commercial orchards from Spain and after here in Southern California, also in citrus. Uh, around one and a half year ago, I started this proactive biological project, uh, project sorry, for the Spoderlander fly with Professor Mark Hodel. Um, so this talk will have two different parts. First, I will introduce the Spoderlander fly problem with uh, Californian perspective. And then I will present some results that we have obtained about the behavior of the parasitoid candidate and status orientalis. <laughs> Sorry, uh, California acquires, uh, acquires uh, around nine new species of atropos per year, uh, of which around three will become pests, uh, requiring some type of management. Approximately 44% of non-native atropos establishing in California originate from invasions bridgeheads. These are pest populations that are established elsewhere in the US and are infestation sources for California. As an example, California has recently received three high profile invasive uh, species that have originated from invasions breedheads. Um, as Ricky Lara told you yesterday, brown marmorid stingback, Alimorpha halis, a native from China, is a highly polyphagous pest that invaded Pennsylvania in 1998 and established in California around 2005. In 2010, South American palm weevil, Rhincophorus palmarum, native from Central and South um, America, uh, was detected in Tijuana, in Baja California, Mexico, and established in San Diego County around 2014, killing hundreds of ornamental Canary Island day palms. And then the last example, Asian citrus silip, the Diaphorina citri, native from the Indian subcontinent, was detected in Florida in 1995, and later in 2008 was detected in San Diego, California. ACP is the vector of the lethal, uh, lethal malady, sorry, uh, named Juan Long B or HLB. The establishment of ACP has created significant turmoil for California three billion year citrus industry. Uh, with Californian point of view, the insect pest was um, sorry. The invasion potential of these three insect pests was obviously high, and in retrospect, their incursion was predictable and mitigating steps should, be, should have been taken in advance of their arrival. Given these past trends and the identifiable threat invasion reheads posed to California, there are two important questions to consider. Are there other incursion threats established in the US that California should be aware of? And if so, can proactive steps be taken to mitigate economic or ecological damage that could result from successful incursion, establishment, proliferation, and spread of potential new pests? We have identified Spoderlander fly, Licorma delicatula, as a significant uh, invasion threat to California, and a pest that is an excellent target for prior uh, proactive biological control. Proactive biological control is the selection, screening, and approval for release of a natural enemy for the classical biological control of an invasive pest in advance of the anticipated incursion and establishment of the target pest in the area of concern. There are three primary reasons we consider Spoderlander fly a strong candidate for proactive biological control. There are already invasions bridgeheads that are well established in several northeastern US states. Second, this pest has demonstrated a propensity um, for rapid spread and explosive population growth. Rapid spread uh, is most likely occurring because of indiscriminate egg laying on non plant material that is later moved to new areas and from which new infestations start. We will see this later. And third is a pest of several agricultural crops, including California specialty crops. Uh, but let's start with these points one, one, one by one. What are the host plants and the damage that the spotted lanternfly can do? The principal host plant is an ornamental tree. 
Islantus Altissima or Free or Heaven. Uh, but also, but the spotted lanternfly also feed on a wide range of fruit, ornamental and woody trees. As example, we can see on the picture on the right, high infestations of spotted lanternfly on apples uh, in South Korea. So is of a special concern to grapes, hops, and stone fruit crops. High infestations of spotted lanternfly result in heavy honeydew and sooty molds on the infested trees. It will not kill the tree the same year, but it debilitates the tree of the, or, or the vine as it happened already in the East Coast. So the next year, the plant will decrease the production or the plant will not survive uh, the winters. Here, we can see um, a short video of the spotted lanternfly. If I can put it again, I mean, it's very short, <laughs> but there were spotted lanternfly adults uh, feeding on, on grapes. Usually, spotted lanternfly, uh, spotted lanternfly sorry, have one generation per year. The first instar nymphs will emerge around May, June. And throughout the summer, the nymphs will develop to second and third instar nymphs. Uh, these nymphs are black with some white spots, as you can see in the picture. And the four instar nymph um, will start to, to appear uh, around August. Uh, these nymphs are black, with, uh, with black, white, and, and red, as, as we can see in the, in the second picture. The, the nymphs can disperse long distances, jumping from the top of the branches to the soil and going up again to different trees. The adults will appear around September. All of this is always depending on the temperature that, uh, of the area. Uh, but we can see, for example, adults as early as July, as it happened this year. The adults need a period to copulate and mature the eggs. So we can see that uh, we can differentiate the females that are ready to lay eggs because they have a white wax on the abdomen as we can see in, in this picture. On this video, we can see how it is a fresh egg mass that probably was laid some hours or few days ago. Is a special kind of wasp that cover the eggs, and this wax uh, will become uh, will become sorry uh, drier over the time, and it will crack, and it will be more difficult to differentiate the egg mass from the bark of the trunks. Another feature of the spotted lanternfly of the position is that it is that it is indiscriminate as I was telling before. They can lay eggs, eggs on the tree trunks, but also on stone rocks, wood, and any construction material, or even in biocops. That it is key to understand how fast the spotted lanternfly can spread through the country and arrive to California. Any car traveling from the east to west could have an spotted lanternfly egg mass that might start an invasion in California. Here we can see an egg mass that was laid in the underside, underside of the bark, making difficult to be, to be detected, for example. And this picture on the left, we can see how close they lay eggs when it is, when it is a zone of high infestation of a spotted lanternfly. And on the right, let me put video, um, we can see uh, it's a forest area close to, 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 to in Philadelphia. There, was, there were thousands of spotted lanternfly in, in these Islantus trees, in black walnuts, in maples. In, it, was, it was very, very high. So the spotted lanternfly is native uh, from China and invaded South Korea back in 2004 and arrived to Japan in 2013. One year later, in 2014, it was detected for the first time in Pennsylvania 
possibly spoiler under fly arrive to to that area uh, on some construction materials uh, coming from china um here we can see the updated map of spoiler lantern fly distribution in the east coast the counties in blue are the ones with the high spoiler lantern fly infestation in the states of pennsylvania new jersey delaware west virginia virginia madison and connecticut but the spoiler lantern fly have been also found in places as far as boston massachusetts and in the west of north carolina uh, as we can see, the small purple um, uh, here on the, on the left of, of the picture, the small uh, purple point. This indicates the rapid spray capacity of this invasive species. Indeed, what is scary the most is that the spotted lanternfly has a wide range of suitable hosts and its potential distribution published by Woki and collaborators using a Maxim model uh, is all over the uh, USA. And it is a wide range of, of, of uh, potential distribution. We can see on this map that especially California will be a high suitable area for spotted lanternfly to invite. It is confirmed because already has happened in the East Coast that can produce damage to the grapes of our beloved wines. But we can see that the areas of suitability coincide with the wine areas of California. But it has been reported attacks to peaches and apples, orchards in South Korea and Japan, crops that have economic importance in California too. Since this project started in June of 2018, the spotted lanternfly adults have been detected 11 times in airports of Ontario, Stockton, and Sacramento, in planes arriving from Philadelphia, Connecticut, and Ohio. Uh, this last one possibly from a connection with an airport from Philadelphia. But any of these adults was alive. In 2020, the CDFA found 37 spotted lanternfly adults, from which two were alive. That means that the populations in the East Coast are increasing and the probability of invasions breed heads towards California also increase. These were only the interceptions made on flights coming from inside US, but there is also a threat from ships from Asia arriving to the Californian seaports or the ground transportation. As, a, as example, in October of this year, one dead adult was detected in a nursery in Corvallis, Oregon. Despite, despite the great efforts from the different departments of agriculture to detect all the spotted lantern fly arriving to the West Coast, it seems obvious that this invasive pest is going to arrive to the West Coast sooner than later. To resume, what are the challenges to contain the spread of a spotted lanternfly? As I mentioned before, um, the egg masses are cryptic and the oviposition is indiscriminate, making it difficult to detect it. A spotted lanternfly has a wide range of plant hosts that it makes difficult to target one specific plant in the monitoring of the pest. Adults can fly long distances. They, they uh, they are no good flyers, but a big groups of them have been observed using thermals to disperse. On top of that, the nymphs, as I mentioned before too, have a good capacity of dispersion. And we didn't observe uh, uh, a good mortality from natives and resident natural enemies. So what are the steps to develop a biological control program for an invasive species? First, we need to identify and evaluate native natural enemies in the US, if any. This is very important since you can use the weapons that you have already at home. We are looking in the areas where you can find the native uh, lanternflies relatives uh, in US but by now we didn't have any success on this. The second step, it will conduct 
it will be to conduct a foreign exploration to find natural enemies in the native area of the pest. Then, when the natural enemy is identified, we need to develop a reading system and to evaluate the life, the life history, the life cycles, the behaviors, and genetics of recovered parasitoids. At the same time, we need to study the host specificity of these promising parasitoids. And finally, if everything is okay, uh, and the parasitoid will not suppose an, an environmental risk for the native fauna, get the approval for release. It is a long way before a biological control program is ready to be effective. So we are proposing here a proactive biocontrol project. Instead of the typical reactive approach to developing classical biocontrol programs, we are advocating a disruptive proactive response, having natural enemies screened and approved for release in advance of the anticipated arrival of an identifiable threat. This proactive approach will save at minimum two, three years of time and will likely result in significant curtailment not only of pest population growth, but also rates of spread. The success of this project will help preserve existing uh, IPM programs in affected crops. A classical biological control program targeting the spotted lanternfly has been already initiated by the USDA office in Massachusetts, led by Julie Gold and Hannah Brolday, and the USDA Beneficial Insect Introduction Research Unit in Delaware, led by Kim Holmer. The team from the East Coast, in, collabor in collaboration with um, with the Chinese Academy of Forestry carried out exploratory surveys for spotted lanternfly and its natural enemies in 27 provinces of China since 2015. They collected egg masses, deployed sentinel egg masses, trapped um, spotted lanternfly nymphs, and used yellow sticky traps. And they found the spotted lanternfly in 22 of the 27 regions and they brought back to US at least two parasitoids. The first one is the egg parasitoid Anastatus orientalis, a neopelmid that had been used already in South Korea to develop a biocontrol uh, program. The second one is an infal parasitoid Drinus sinicus from the family Drinidae. This parasitoid has a distinct raptorial forelegs, as we can see in the picture, use it, use it for grasping uh, the prey. In this case, the second and third instar nymphs of the spotted lanternfly. This future, to be parasitoid of the nymphs, it makes difficult to rear, since you need to rear also the spotted lanternfly nymphs. So we, we are proposing here to use the egg parasitoid Anastatus orientalis for the development of this proactive biocontrol project. We think that Anastatus orientalis is a good candidate since in the native range, parasiting rates on spotted lanternfly egg masses is good, averaging around 40% per egg mass with about 30% of egg masses surveyed being parasitized. Anastatus orientalis has a clear sexual dimorphism. The females are larger than the males, and the females has also a distinct pattern on the wings and in the abdomen, as we can see in, in these pictures. Hannah Broadley uh, and collaborators from the East Coast have been studying the parasitoid since they uh, brought it from China and saw results about the reading system and life history had been published uh, last week. On summary, they found that Anastatus orientalis can parasitize at the same level egg masses collected in fall, fresh uh, egg masses or new egg masses, and egg masses that were stored at five Celsius, five uh, degrees Celsius, and 75% uh, of humidity, up to 10 months, what we call all masses. In figure 
A, we can see the number of parasitized eggs on new and old masses. In figure B, is the proportion of eggs parasitized. In both figures, we cannot see significant differences between new and old egg masses. Our colleagues also found that the parasitoid of spring sex ratio proportion between females and males emerged was not affected by the age of the egg masses. This result is a very good one because it means that we can collect the Spoderlander fly egg masses and store them at five degrees Celsius up to 10 months to use in the reading of our biocontrol agent. Uh, this facilitates the mass production of the parasitoid, uh, one of the most important steps on the biological control projects. Another important study in the classical biological control programs is the host specificity testing. How specific is the biocontrol agent that we want to release in front of native species rela related to a spoder lanternfly? This is a key factor to decide if the release of the parasitoid is going to be a risk for the local fauna. The safety testing used to be done at family level, as we can see in this um, um, diagram. For example, in the East Coast, they had selected 11 species of plant hoppers from the uh, superfamily Fulgoroidea, uh, plant hoppers that are large, they have a large body, are univoltine, overwinter as eggs, like a spoder lanternfly, and lay eggs on above ground portions of the plant, the same like a spoder lanternfly. They started to study if a species like Poblithia fuliginosa, Calyptoproctus marmoratus, and other native plant hoppers inside of the superfamily Fulgoroidea are suitable hosts for Anastatus orientalis. But due to initial results suggesting non target parasitins by Anastatus outside of plant hoppers, East Coast team. Uh, now is testing a broad range of uh, species. They found that Anastatus orientalis can parasitize, for example, the native fulgorid, Publicia fulginosa, and the native Acanalonidae, Acanalonia vivitate. In the, in the last case, in the case of the Acanalonia, only producing males. But they also found that Anastatus orientalis can parasitize the pentatomid of which Ricky Lara talked yesterday, the brown marmorate testing bug. That is, is an insect that is uh, far phylogenetically uh, talking uh, from the spotted lanternfly. And for example, Anastatus orientalis was able to parasitize the Saturnidae moth Actias luna among other species that are not phylogenetically close to the spoder lanternfly. These are bad news. So where we are now on the proactive biocontrol of a spoder lanternfly in California? As I mentioned before, we did not find any native natural enemy yet. The foreign exploration was already done by our collaborators in the East Coast. However, we would like to keep looking when the COVID situation allow us to travel to, to Asia. The reading method for Anastatus oriental is already developed. The, 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 our collaborators already published it. And we are in close collaboration with Hannah and the team of the East Coast to study the life history and futures of the recovered parasitoids. It is also important to investigate the native non-target host, if any, inhabiting the West Coast to see if there is a different um, pattern as we saw in the previous results. Uh, here, I would like to share uh, with you part of a film that was made on the summer of 2018 about our exploration looking for native landerflies in the Southeast of Arizona. 
the only place in the West Coast where you can find the closest relatives to the Spoder lanternfly. If we are to use natural enemies to suppress populations of spotted lanternfly to lower levels, we need to understand whether those parasites that we bring from China will have an adverse and unwanted effect on the native insect fauna here in the southwestern parts of the United States. The first objective is to capture adult lanternflies at night using a black light. It's probably not really fair to say that they're being attracted by the bugs so much as it's just screwing up their navigation system. Normally we'll navigate using the moon because that's about the only thing that's visible in the dark that you can steer by to go in a straight line. But if you create an artificial moon, like a UV bulb like this, then any beetle that's flying past it is going to get confused between that and an actual moon. And what that winds up doing is it makes them basically crash into wherever you put the light. So far the trip has been extremely successful. We have captured adult lanternflies at night using the black lights. on that damp piece of paper. He's still moving, so he's still alive. So we're hoping that he'll go off of that paper, start feeding on this bark, in the cracks of the bark. And to help with that, Francesca's peeled away a little bit of bark, so it's not so thick. So you're gonna have easy access to the food conducting tubes in the tree trunk. The second objective is to cage those lanternflies onto possible native host plants. These could either be junipers or oaks. So the way they work is that we open them up. And we fit them over a branch like this. Seal up the end with the drawstring. And we put our insects in here. And the idea is that they'll feed on this plant and they'll live and we can study their biology. A major breakthrough for us was with the insecticide fogging. And as you can see in this container, who would have thought that much insect life were living on these trees behind me? We have the first nymphs for these lanternflies. These have not been seen before. And because they fell out of the trees that we were fogging with insecticide, we feel very confident that those immature stages are probably feeding on the juniper trees that we were fogging. And this is the first record we've got for the potential host plant species that some of these lanternflies may be feeding on. So that's been a real breakthrough for us. So to complete this enormous task, first we must identify, as we saw in the video, collect and rare the native Fulgoridae southwest fauna of which there are numerous rare and indescribed species. This uh, morphological and molecular uh, level taxonomic uh, work uh, is folded into this project, as it will help with selection of non-target species for safety testing on the West Coast. By now, we have collected and identified five different species of Fulgoridae. And we were able to test the host suitability for Anastatus uh, orientalis in two of the five species. Uh, these Fulgoridae species are so rare that the host plant was unknown, as we saw in the video, and also probably nobody had documented the egg masses before. In the picture on the bottom right, you can see the egg masses of the one of the Alfina species captured in Chiricahua Mountains, southeast of Arizona in, in summer of 2019. 
Thirpoptus banduzei of the family Poiserinae, recovered this last summer in, in the same place, in the Chiricahua Mountains, was also tested for parasitins by Anastatus orientalis. We can see in the bottom right the egg masses of this uh, rare species. The parasitoid was not able to parasitize egg masses from both Alfina and Sirpoptus. That were uh, good news. But unfortunately, we have also confirmed that Anastatus orientalis was able to parasitize egg masses from some species belonging to the Heteroptera suborder, as the brown marmoret stingback. Uh, and also some Lepidoptera from Saturnidae family natives from the west coast only. Here we can see a, a picture, uh, uh, a parasitoid female <coughs> of Anastatus parasitizing one of the Saturnidae eggs that we have offered. We need to continue investigating, performing experiments with shorter times of exposure, since Anastatus orientalis females were exposed to this non-target species for seven days. This is a long exposure time, and we will need also to perform choice experiments to address the specificity of Anastatus orientalis to the Spodelanter fly egg masses. In the meanwhile, we are also studying uh, the parasites and host feeding behavior of the parasitoid. The host feeding behavior is when the parasitoid also feeds on the emolymph of the host to get more proteins to produce their own eggs. Uh, the host feeding behavior of Anastatus orientalis has been observed sporadically in previous studies and during our previous assays. However, the possible negative effects of host feeding on the target host are undescribed. For example, it is not clear if the parasitoid use the same egg to host fed and to oviposit, or if it use a different egg. The description and effects of host feeding behaviors will help with interpreting results from planet non-target host experiments, since Anastatus orientalis may use non-target eggs as host, as a source of protein only, or both. To investigate the host feeding behavior of Anastatus orientalis on a fly, parasitoid females mated and mated of three different ages, 24 hours, 72 hours, and 120 hours, were video recorded for 24 hours. Over these exposure periods, the females were exposed to a Spoderlander fly egg mass, and we tracked the number of events and the time allocated to each of the following behaviors. Here we can see uh, time spent contacting egg mass, as we can see in this, in this video, where the parasitoid is, is drumbling with, with, the, with the antenna to, to find a, a good egg to, uh, to, to oviposit. And also we track the oviposition and host feeding. Here to clarify, we are calling oviposition to any stinging behavior that the wasp was performing, independently if they lack uh, uh, an egg or not. And we also track the time that the wasp were uh, resting and feeding on honey droplets that we, we offered. Uh, pictures of the egg mass on each of the position event. We can see the pictures on the left. We mark the, the wasp with a yellow uh, cross. Uh, were taken, the pictures were taken to allocate uh, all the eggs where the female spent time inserting the ovipositor or and host feeding. After 24 hours, the egg mass was placed in an environmental room for the development of the parasitoid, that is around one month. And after the parasitoid development period, the emergence was checked daily and recorded. And a digital photo was taken to be used for comparison with the images which had been taken in each of the position event in the videos. As an example, in the big picture, uh, we can see that the wasp performed 
of the position in 10 different locations. We can see the, the 10 different numbers. The X market on green means that a parasitoid wasp emerged since a wrong shape emergence hold appeared. The X market in red means that no wasp emerged. In this case, a spoiler lanternfly nymph could emerge. And we will see an oval shape emergence hole. Or maybe just the egg die and nothing emerged from, from them. In the following slides, we are going to show some of the results that we have obtained on these on this, uh, different experiments. In the first figure on the left, uh, we can see the average time spent spend by the wasps in contact with the egg masses. For wasps with three different ages and mated on pink and no mated on white. As expected, older females spend more time in contact with egg masses. But interestingly, the 72 hours non-mated females spend less time in contact with the egg mass than the already mated of the same age. It seems that the mating it has a significant effect on the time that the females will be spent looking for a suitable host. The figure of the right shows how many of these contacts finish it in an overposition event. We can observe no differences between mated and non-mated swaps that were about 120 hours old. In the following two figures, we can observe that mated all females spend more time drilling or depositing as we expected. But it seems that there is not significant differences in the time consumed uh, host feeding, uh, as we can see in the figure on the right. Another interesting result is that looking the two figures at a time, it seems that 120 hours old non-mated females consume more time drilling or depositing with the objective to host fed. These and other observed behaviors will be confirmed in future analysis and experiments. The last result that I would like to show today is how many of a spring we have obtained on this experiment. A total of 71 eggs were stinged by the uh, with the ovipositor and 40 wasps was emerged. That means a 56% of parasiting success for all the wasps of all the ages, mated and non-mated. Anastatus orientalis also performed host feeding on the 37 of the eggs but the host feeding did not have a negative effect on the progeny since a wasp emerged from the 81% of the eggs that experienced host feeding. In fact, it seems that the host feeding is a crucial step for parasiting success since no wasps emerged from the 58% of the eggs that were not host fed. We can say now that Anastatus orientalis performed a concurrent host feeding, which means that the wasp used the same host to get extra proteins and lay the eggs. So to conclude, uh, due to the high probability of arrival of the spotted lantern fly and the threat that will suppose for the Californian crops, a proactive biological control program will help to be ready before the pest will spread. The parasitoid candidate, Anastatus orientalis, seems not specific in the non-choice experiments on the non-target uh, uh, host. Uh, choice experiments will be necessary to evaluate the environmental risk releasing this parasitoid species. Anastatus orientalis, Older females spend more time in contact and in depositing the spotted lanternfly egg masses and perform concurrent host feeding. In case of the release, if someday happens, <laughs> of this parasitoid, we might increase its efficacy releasing wasps that are at least 
120 hours old, and wolves that didn't have a previous contact with spotted lanternfly ecmasis. So um, to finish, I would like to thank all the collaborators from the East Coast that helped me to start this project, providing us with wasps, egg masses, and inputs. And thanks also to part of the Hodel Lab that helped me with a lot of stuff. And of course, to Doc Janega, who have been helping on this project to collect and to identify the, the, the native fulgorians. Thank you. Thank you, Francesc. Very nice presentation. We have four minutes left for Aubrey's going to um, ask you the questions that are in the Q&A. Let me see. No, Aubrey will read them to you. Ah, okay, okay. Um, can I stop to share the... Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. So uh, the first question is, uh, your research appears to be strictly related to California. Is parallel research occurring with respect to the infested geography in the Eastern US? And then can that research be applied to the Western US and vice versa? Can you, can you say that again, sorry? So- Can you repeat? The research is uh, strictly related to California. So is yeah. there parallel research going on in the Eastern US? Yeah, there is, there is a, a, they started before. They, they had the pest uh, back in 2014. So they started to look for the, for the, um, the, the natural enemies in the, in the area of the spotted lanternfly in 2015, 2016. So we honestly take advantage of that uh, research that was started already. And, and we started with the parasitoids that they, they brought from China. And I think that was a good start because uh, we, we could um, test this anastatus with the native uh, lanternflies or native other species from, from, the, from the West Coast. Awesome. Yes. Uh, the second question is, are there any traps that can be used at airports and ship docks to trap any adults that may have made the trips to California? Yeah, that, that, that is a good question. For example, for, for the X masses, for sure, we need to check carefully. Uh, I, I know that the departments of agriculture and, and, uh, and I think, I don't remember the name of the other department, but uh, yeah, uh, is, is, is checking very careful about this because it's, it's difficult to, to check. Uh, they are doing a, a great job. And for the adults, if there were some uh, arriving alive, it would be nice to have a pheromone because a trap uh, needs a pheromone mostly because I don't think that that maybe big yellow traps, but or traps on the posts or on the trees, but uh, a trap in these in these areas in the airports or in, or in the seaports, um, I think that might need a, a pheromone that is not is not ready. I, I don't I don't know if uh, somebody is studying that. Probably yes, because it's very important for, for an invasive pest, uh, but uh, it's not ready, I think. Okay, great. Um, I think that's the last of the questions and we're done with time. Thank you, Frances. Thank you so much for presenting today. Thank you, Cindy, for, for the invitation. You're welcome. <laughs>